Hello, I'm Maria Kadabai and welcome to this BAFTA Q&A for MLK FBI. We are joined by director Sam Pollard and producer and writer Benjamin Hadeen. Welcome, Sam and Benjamin. My thank pleasure. You. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you both doing? I'm good. Yeah, well, hanging in. Um, you must have been asked this question so many times, but I'm going to ask the most obvious. Um, can you tell us about how the project started, the timeline for it, and perhaps um, some of the reservations in approaching kind of a massive undertaking of perhaps the most iconic symbol of civ uh, American civil rights in the US even today? Um, I'm going to let Ben start off today with this answer. Um, so <clears throat> I first had the idea to make the film almost exactly four years ago in January of 2017 when I was researching um, another project. I was writing about King and his response to the Vietnam War um, and the backlash that he suffered. And, and um, you know, I was curious on how it had affected the FBI surveillance of him. Um, to come out against the war during a time when it was still, for the most part, popular at home in the spring of 1967. So I read this book by David Garrow, the FBI and Martin Luther King Jr. And almost right away within the first few pages, I said, you know, I, this, I think, is a movie. Um, and, and so at, at that point, I approached Sam about the project. Um, you know, January 2017, it, it was a, um, a different time in some ways from where we are now, but it was the month Trump got inaugurated. Um, and, and when he was sworn in, everyone kept saying, it's important that we have faith in our institutions. This, can't, this became kind of an American cliche. And every time I heard it, I would say to myself, you know, what planet is this person living on? we are where we are in our history because of our institutions um, and their predisposition to uphold white supremacy. Um, it was also the month that Colin Kaepernick played his last game of football, American football. You, you know, he was blackballed from the league here for um, kneeling during the national anthem. And, you know, it was a painful reminder of, of how threatening black protest still is to white America. Um, so when Sam and I set off on MLK FBI, it wasn't just the story of the surveillance, but it was also viewing it as a point of entry into um, these other issues. Um, you know, the, the sort of conspiracy and the top level of government of undermining the civil rights movement. Um, and as I said, white America's fear of black protest. And if you looked at kind of those organizations that kind of run American, obviously FBI being in the title, but the notion of the fear of something like the FBI on the idea of dissent, on the idea of protest and doing everything in all their power to suppress it, is at the very obviously is the center of the film. Um, with the documents that you're dealing with that so recently being publicly available, um, how do you, how, what was the level of responsibility that you both felt in I don't want to say redrafting history in a way, but presenting a certain side of history that may not have been seen before. I think we both felt, you know, a very serious responsibility to do it, you know, carefully with nuance and, and, and professionalism. And, you know, we're looking at an aspect of Dr. King's career that has in his life that hadn't really been dug into. We, you know, we were trying to look at the man in a 180 degree way. You know, so we wanted to show him both as, you know, as A. Philip Randolph says at the very beginning of the film, the moral leader of the civil rights movement, but also we wanted to show him too as a human being who had a lot on his plate. I mean, here's a man who's thrown into the spotlight in 55, 56 with the Montgomery bus boycott. Here's a man with his other associates decides to create an organization that's going to battle and try to batter down the walls of segregation in the South. Here with the Southern, with the creation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Here's a man who by 1963 in his March on Washington speech is really at the height of the movement, the leader of the movement. And it, and it, it frightens someone like J. Edgar Hoover and William Sullivan and other members of the FBI who feels, you know, he's the most dangerous Negro in America. So here's a man who also knows between 63 and 68 that he's being constantly surveilled and monitored by the FBI. 
And he also has a very complicated personal life. Mm. You know, he's dealing with winning the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, he's dealing with keeping his colleagues on a path. You know, he's dealing with the successes and the failures that he had in city after city. I mean, going to Albany, going to Birmingham, going to Chicago, Cicero, where it wasn't as successful for, for the civil rights movement. Here's a man who by 67, you know, as Ben was talking about how he sort of got into this reading David Garrow's book, his man by 67 decides he wants to basically announce that he's against the war in Vietnam, knowing full well the impact it would have on his relationship with the Johnson administration, who mm. was very pro-Vietnam. So he's dealing, he's juggling lots of balls. So we felt we wanted to really dig into all of that in this film, which I think, you know, that Ben and I did with our team, a great team of Brian Becker and Laura Tomaselli, our editor, Brian Becker, our archival producer, the people who shot the recreations for us. We did, a, I think we had a, a great team to help us do this film. You've kind of really mentioned some of the, obviously the key um, historical um, points and moments in the film, but also uh -huh. the look at the idea of structure. I know the film covers so much, obviously it covers Vietnam, communism, Johnson, um, key political moments that then transpire and have effects for the kind of next couple of decades. So just to both of you talk about how the structure of the piece, how you kind of put that narrative together and how you pick those kind of key moments to build it. Well, you know, what we were trying to create and, and Ben can jump in after I finish, we were trying to create what I call a parallel story. Looking at Dr. King and his ascension, the civil rights movement at the same time as the FBI is surveilling wiretapping, bugging this gentleman and his associates, Clarence Jones and others, to try to figure out a way to discredit and destroy Dr. King's reputation. And we're trying to build that parallel narrative that really in some ways leads to the only meeting these two men ever had when Hoover was invited to meet with, with uh, Hoover, or when King was invited to meet with Hoover mm. at the White House. So we're trying to create that narrative. Now, what's fascinating with this film is that, and Ben knows this, when we had our first cut Laura put together the, the really the first cut of the whole film. It was over two and a half hours, you know, because we were covering so much material. I mean, we had a whole section about these two brothers, you know, the Childs brothers who were double agents who knew Stanley Levinson, who led to, you know, Levinson who met Dr. King. I mean, that was a thing that we had really wanted to dig into, but in trying to sharpen the narrative unfolding of the story, we had to lose that, you know. So Basically, if you think about the film, it's this parallel journey of these two men, two organizations, SCLC and the FBI. I don't know if Ben wants to add anything, Ben? Well, you know, I would say that it, the, the trajectory you mentioned of, of the 1960s and Red Scare and communism leading to the Vietnam War, that is familiar. What's not familiar is a time when King was viewed as a threat to the state mm. and, and was unpopular. And so, you know, revisiting that time span from the point of view of the FBI, it would sort of restore him to his original danger and, and radicalism. Um, because now he's, he's been sainted over be, beyond all recognition in, in our country. Um, and, and so we wanted to rec reclaim, as Sam said earlier, the, the human dimension of King. That is so interesting, yeah, because it's something that I um, did not know at all and kind of the how um, at the time of kind of, of King, obviously how Ho Hoover was revered in the US and he was you know, the heroic bastion of you know, freedom and how obviously over time, kind of the more we found out about Hoover's kind of life and kind of checkered, checkered or kind of, you know, who he was as a person. And then how, you know, how you said it kind of how it's turned and how MLK has become iconic and those have re reversed in a way. Sam, you mentioned kind of that meeting between MLK and Hoover. And then there's a one line we said, we've, when, um, when MLK says we've reached an understanding and you can kind of see the nervousness in him, in King then, and it's just kind of, to have an idea of what went on in that room, kind of just, yeah, to, to talk about kind of, that was, it was so powerful and it said so much was just in that one line. Well, what, you know, what Andy Young says in the interview, basically who did most of the talking, mm. you know? And what I think is fascinating about that particular sequence is how 
Dr. King is able to dance around the questions from the press as he's walking down that hall, yeah. you know, and when they finally get to the elevator, he's able to sort of stop it by saying, oh, I got to get on the elevator. You know, this shows you that, you know, I, I just think that he felt that it was important for him to sit and confront Hoover about Hoover calling him the most notorious liar, you know, not that he was going to get Hoover to apologize. I don't believe he ever did. But he wanted to have it on record that he finally wanted to sit down and have a confrontation, a dialogue, even though it wasn't really a dialogue from the way Andy Young said it, you know, that there was this, they, they finally came together. That's what happened in that dialogue, supposed dialogue between those two men. Um, the, uh, of the, um, the whole film is obviously made up of this incredible archive footage, and that must have been a huge feat to collate, put together, and just, you just perhaps, Benjamin, if you can talk a little bit, kind of how that process began, how you kind of, that were, and how you decided that was the direction to go in as well, rather than having kind of, you know, talking heads or. Well, you know, the decision was made immediately. Um, <clears throat> even when we, when we look back at the demo reel we made to, to raise money for this film, you don't see any of the interviewees. Um, and so then when photography began and we did more interviews, Sam and I said, well, you know, we set ourselves this challenge, let, let's stick to it. I, I didn't even want to bring a camera on the interviews. <laughs> mm. <laughs> sort of force our hand, but um, Sam made us bring one for safety. And I'm, I'm so <laughs> glad because you do see them in the end, yeah. Yeah. which was a brilliant idea by our editor, Laura. Um, you know, Sam had worked on a Sinatra film where they don't show the people and yeah, it, it is very hard, um, but, but if you can pull it off, it's a special filmic experience, I think. And, um, you know, I'll let Sam talk about this, but we went to our archival producer, Brian, and we said, you know, you got to find stuff that people haven't seen. Um, and he thankfully. came through. And he came through, yeah. Thankfully, <laughs> some stuff had just been digitized. Um, it had been stored on 35 millimeter in the National Archives. Um, and, you know, Brian pulled some other rabbits out of his hat. Mm -hmm. you yeah, do yeah I mean, you sorry carry on sam yeah it's, it's you know you know i was saying to to some other some other folks that you know i've seen i have seen lots of that footage of king but when brian pulled out that footage of king with his wife coretta scott and their young children and his parents and they're playing in a I guess a basement or something a playroom that's like wow that's like gold mm -hmm. and when he when he uncovered I had never even seen the material of Dr. King. His first, it seems like it was his first television interview in Montgomery, Alabama, when he's talking to a reporter right before they start the interview. That's gold. And then to find the footage of Scotland Yard with James O. Ray in custody. <laughs> you know, those things are like amazing finds, you know, when you're working on a documentary, archival documentary film, yeah. to find those things. The, um I love the contradictory nature of kind of what you're seeing and what you're hearing. And I'm just wondering how the approach for that came immediately or if, if that was, you know, or it was that decided later on. Well, you know, it's, I, I would say this, I would say it's, be, it's part of the editing process that as you as an editor puts together the archive material, in this case, Laura, she's finding bites and selects from the interviews that, that she feels would be appropriate. Now, Ben and I went through the transcripts and we gave her what we thought were selects. Well, a good editor not only uses what we offer, but she comes up with other pieces that she thinks can be effective in shaping the story. I mean, a really good example is her shaping of the sequence when Clarence Jones comes home and he's, his wife tells him that she didn't know he was having a repa telephone repairman come over to change the phone and him understanding that he's probably being wiretapped, mm. you know? And the way she edited that, the voiceover and the use of the footage of the old movie clips that we gave her, ah, it was really done extremely well. Beautiful, beautiful job. I love, yeah, I love the idea of those um, old uh, film clips and it kind of almost um, shows the, how the media were complicit in supporting the FBI, not only kind of obviously with this specifically, but the, how media um, have been complicit in promoting certain um, certain narratives and certain themes that then become widely believed as truth, even if they are seen in kind of a narrative fiction film. And is that the root kind of why you decided to, to kind of pick 
those certain kind of fictional pieces to put in? Well, the reason we picked the picture, the fictional pieces, is because I had said to Laurie at the beginning of the editing process, besides the archival footage of the FBI, there's also these old Hollywood movies that extol the virtues of the FBI in fighting communism. You know, like I Walk a Crooked Mile, I Was a Communist for the FBI, Big Jim McLean, and the FBI story with Jimmy Stewart. So I knew that there'd be clips and pieces that she could take from the film to use. Now, I think it should be clearly you know, stated that as much as J. Edgar Hoover and William Sullivan wanted the, the press to grab onto these stories about King, First, there's this possible association with the FBI, and then his very complicated personal life. They never did. This, the press in the 60s did not do the kind of you know, work that the press does today. They didn't dig into the people's personal lives to the extent that we do today. You know? So the fact that Hoover couldn't get any traction, in my mind, led to him deciding, let's create this letter that Sullivan wrote, basically, Telling who, uh, telling Dr. King, we know who you are. We know what you've done. This is no, you, you know what you need to do. Intimating he should kill himself, and then on top of that, creating this audio tape that supposedly Dr. King in a situation with another woman sending this all to Red Scott King. I mean, not only to discredit him in the movement, but to even destroy his marriage. I mean, this was this was some underhanded, <laughs> low down, dastardly stuff that Hoover and Sullivan and the FBI was doing. And as Je as Ex-director James Comey says in the film, what does he say, Ben? This is the, what does he say? The darkest part of the history. Yeah. Darkest part of the history of the FBI. Yeah, so it's a, it's a dirty part of the history as well, yeah. And um, we have a question from Elam Shekhofer. Um, so she's asking, she'd love to hear more about how you chose your interviews. Um, it's a small and well-chosen selection of voice. Did you start with a wider range and cut it down the, in the edit or did the narrowing come from research or scripting? Um, I also appreciated the film unfolding as a time capsule in terms of archive, but also seeing this speaks in the present day at the end. Could you talk about the decision and what it means to be working with archive voice in the present day, as well as voices in the past? So it's a two-fold question, how you selected um, those interviews and then working with past and present voices. Well, we knew we didn't want a lot of people. I was saying that usually when I'm doing these docs and Jim and Ben knows this when we did two trains, we, you know, we can interview up to 25 people, you know, and usually it goes down to in the final film, 10 to 15. And this one, we knew there was a small group of people we wanted to focus on. We wanted some confidants of King and Ben realized the two people who were surviving who could be articulate was Clarence Jones and Andy Young. And then we wanted some historians, one who could give us the backstory about the FBI at Hoover and one could talk about the 60s and COINTELPRO. So Ben suggested Beverly Gage and Donna Murch. And then we knew we wanted someone from the FBI and Ben said, there's this guy, Wait, Houston, Texas, Ben, he's in? <laughs> he had named Chuck Knox. And then Ben walked there, came up to me one day and said, what'd you say, Ben? You mean about what, Comey? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, Comey- um, You might you as know, well aim high, you never know. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but he's, he's in there not only for name recognition, but see, I had read that when he was director of the FBI, he kept on his desk the original wiretap request that Hoover had sent to then Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy in October of 1963. And he was on his, it was on his desk and that he kept it there as a reminder of, um, you know, to the possibility of, of overreach and, uh, you know, of domestic spying. Um, and, you know, when he was director of the FBI, he would send prospective agents to the King Memorial on the mall. He would have them write papers on King you know, he tried to take what he called the darkest chapter, as Sam said, of the FBI's history, bring it out into light. Um, and, you know, we wanted him to, to speak about that. We have another question. Um, oh, someone's asking where they can watch a documentary. So in the UK, it will be um, available via Dogworth on their player. But if you go to dogworth.com, you'll see where else it might be available to watch in the UK as well. Um, just to, the surveillance takes kind of under, some of under lock and key until 2027, as you've spoke, uh, mentioned in the film. Um, 
was it a predicament um, or a challenge not to have them? Um, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that, you know, Ben did a tremendous amount of research and homework in finding these transcripts that were redacted in places, but there was enough information there to help us shape and tell the story. I mean, sure, it would have been wonderful to have the actual tapes, and maybe Ben and I will have to consider, you know, follow up. a follow-up 30-minute film <laughs> when the tapes come out. But I think that, you know, those transcripts and what we, what you can read in those transcripts are really really intense material it, it presents it shows you how far the F would, fbi would go to discredit dr king um, yeah i mean this is it's kind of a fine distinction the audio is under seal but as sam said you know a great deal of the paper you know i don't know more than three-fourths off the top of my head is available for public viewing um so you know there's there anything could happen in 2027 i'm not saying we won't learn a lot but we already know quite a bit. Um, and we felt that one of the purposes and virtues of the film, which uh, thankfully has been pointed out by some of the early reviews, was to was to prepare people for this classification. Yeah. To sort of, you know, take our, we, this was our chance to um, influence the debate or the reception of Fraction, if we could. Um, Helen Jerome is asking, thank you for a fascinating documentary. What shock or surprised you the most when researching for the film? You know, I'm not going to say it shocked me because I'm, I've been around a long time now. But, you know, what's become fascinating for me about doing these films that look at this history is that, you know, I lived through these, this, this history. Mm. And uh, if, you, if you had did a time travel thing and saw Sam Pollard in 1964, I thought Jay Hoover, Jay Hoover was fantastic. You know, I watched all those old movies with pleasure and joy. I, I was a Sunday night watcher of the FBI series with Efren Zemlis Jr. I thought the FBI were the good guys. I thought America should be in Vietnam. You know, even though I admired Dr. King, you know, I was, I didn't know all of this backstory, all the, the complicated skullduggery that was happening with the <laughs> FBI. You know, so that's what's fascinating to me is that how as I revisit all this stuff now that I grew up, you know, basically surrounded by, how I can really see how really complex it was. And I didn't know anything about it. I mean, here I am, a young African-American teenager in 1963, you know, November 22nd, my teacher comes into the classroom and says, school will be closed today because John F. Kennedy has just been shot in Dallas, Texas. I was like, astounded. And then five years later, April 2nd, 1968, I had turned 18 years old. And two days later, I'm in my apartment, my parents' apartment. And Walter Cronkite, who was the dean of the evening news in America, comes on and interrupts the telecast that's on there and says, Dr. Martin Luther King has just been assassinated at the, at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. I mean, who knew? I didn't know how complex this history is. And that to me is the revelation for me as a filmmaker today. There's um, complexities of that history and kind of obviously, um, I love the word skullduggery, so I'm gonna use it back at you, some skullduggery of the FBI. Obviously that's become apparent um, in other interventions following obviously, not only kind of um, MLK, but far further um, protests and further dissent and further civil rights movements. And what's really eerie um, about the film is kind of its relevance to today. Um, and did that kind of, was that always at the forefront of both of your minds that this is something that, you know, should have, should not be relevant today? Ben, you should go first. Yeah, no, I mean, certainly. But, um... You know, as I said, we always we wanted to use the film as a way to look at these issues. You know, in, in America, over the past decade, we observed 50 years after so many iconic events of the civil rights movement. You know, March on Washington, voting rights movement in Selma, um, and people are, were were just so perplexed by this question of what's changed, how much has changed, um, and you know, the as I said, the white fear of of black protest. That I think has not changed. 
you know, that's a, a, a constant through line. And we thought the film would do a, a good job of exploring that, but we, we certainly could not have predicted the past seven months. Um, you know, we were, the George Floyd protests were the very last weeks of picture lock. Um, and then, you know, January, the insurrection of the Capitol was a week and a half before the release. Um, so, you know, that, even though the whole time we were fixated on the present while we made the movie, not, none of that kind of thing was in our sights. Did you want to add anything, Sam? Yeah, I would, I would completely agree. I mean, we, who, who, knew, who knew that in 2020 we would have a worldwide pandemic? Who knew that there would be the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and other African-Americans? Who knew that the Black Lives Matter movement would have such an impact not only in America, but around the world? You know, who knew that, you know, on January 6th, we would see the hostile, you know, assault on the Capitol. I mean, I, I always thought the film would have a resonance and a relevance to contemporary politics and contemporary social movements today, but not to, to the extent it, it, that it has had. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um... Uh, Nana St. Bartholomew Morgan Brown said, during your research, were you able to discover the reasons for Hoover's paranoid fear and hatred of Dr. King? I think you've touched on that a little bit, but um, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little further. Yeah, here, here, this, is, this, is a simple, <laughs> this is an easy answer. Here we're living in an America in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, where black people are on the fringes of society. We are treated as second-class citizens. And most white people, quite honestly, didn't have any issues with it. They didn't think anything about it. All of a sudden, here comes one man, uh, basically with a group of associates, you know, because we can't forget the Fred Shuttleworths and the, and the Ralph Abernathy's and the Dorothy Cottons and the C.T. Vivians and the Y.T. Walkers and the Roy Wilkins, Whitney Youngs and Abe Philip Randolph. But here comes one man who becomes, at the forefront, becomes a leader of this movement, considered the leader of this movement, who says, black people want to be a part of the mainstream. They don't want to be second-class citizens. So Hoover, to me, as far as I'm concerned, is a stand-in for much of white America who says, oh my God, black people want to be equal now to us? I thought they were happy. They would come and work in our houses. They take care of our kids. You know, they go back to their communities. Sure, we didn't let them sit in the front of the bus in the South. They couldn't sit at a restaurant in the South. You know, they couldn't try and close in the store. What are they worried about? They got, they're okay, you know? That's the issue, you know? That's the obsession that Hoover and Sullivan and the others had because they were looking at a black person who was saying, we want to stand up. We want to be counted part of the mainstream. And that terrified America, terrified America. Um. We have a question from Gail Siegel. Um, she said the film is remarkable. Um, did re researching and making the film have an impact on your view of government and the institutions of government? <laughs> not, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we have Susan Vincent said, um, if Trump had met with some of the Black Lives Matter protesters instead of just standing with a Bible, um, would he have ensured a second term or not? Oh, would he have been what? what? Would he have, so if Trump had met with some of the Black Lives Matter protesters instead of just standing around with the Bible, would he have ensured a second term or not? I, you know, I, I don't know if that one, if meeting with them like alone would have, but I, I do think it was a close election. And I, I do think that any kind of sane response to the protests would have made it even closer and maybe helped Trump. Mm. I mean, I mean, you know, his, his response to the to the protests was to commission a study on how education in America uh, affects people to want to protest white supremacy, the fruits of which he released on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. <laughs> Right, the 1776 commission. So, you know, meeting with them over the summer, who knows? But all he needed to do was to respond sanely. And I think he would have um, held some votes. Well, all I would say that was never gonna be possible because the man was about dividing the nation. 
He was never about unifying the nation at all. He could care less about what people of color thought. He could care less because he's from a generation where he was free, white, and 21. That was the phrase that was used by white people back in the 30s and 40s. They were free, white, and 21, which meant they could do anything they wanted to do. And black people, people of color, native people, didn't matter. Do you feel the tide is turning, Sam? Yeah, what do you mean? What, as, in, as in the tide, as in, do you, are you um, optimistic? For the for future, for the future, for whatever well, listen, the future. Listen, <laughs> I, I have to I have to be constantly optimistic with even with my shade of cynicism. <laughs> because if I wasn't, I'd have to like do my do away with myself. And I'm not gonna do that. You know, I'm not sure about the tide turning. I mean, America, quite honestly, you know, like many of these countries that basically were imperialistic and saw people of color as they could put their feet on their neck, you know. It, it's, it, it takes a long time to sort of get out of that, what I call psychological mindset. And America is, is, mm. is struggling mighty, mightily to try to do that. Um, well, I hope MLK FBI plays some small or even huge part in um, changing that psychology for a lot of people. It's an incredible film. Thank you both for making it. And thank you for joining me, Sam Pollard and Benjamin Hadid. Thank you for your time. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah, thank Have you. a good day. Thank you. Thank you too. Bye. Bye.